Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Amy Bloom is the much acclaimed author of four novels, White Horses, Lucky Us, Away, and Love Invents Us, and three collections of short stories, Where the God of Love Hangs Out, Come to Me, a finalist for the National Book Award, and A Blind Man Can See How Much I Love You, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her most recent book is the New York Times bestselling memoir, In Love, which chronicles a journey she took with her late husband, Brian, to choose the death he wanted after an Alzheimer's diagnosis. It's an extraordinary book and the subject of our conversation today. Amy has written for too many magazines to list here. She has a master's in social work and she is currently the Shapiro Silverberg Professor of Creative Writing at Wesleyan University. Welcome, Amy. So Amy, I just wanna start with a line uh, that stayed with me, the directive that you got from your husband, Brian, please write about this. Can you tell me how it came that he actually was asking you to chronicle this story? Well, I mean, he liked my work. <laughs> he was a fan. Um, he reminded me actually that that was uh, really how we met for the first time. I was, I, I think I was doing something and um, uh, he came over to me and he said, oh, I hear you're a writer. And I was like, yes. And he was like, well, should I read your work? This is back when he was being an ass. Um, and he was like, should I read your work? And I said, that's up to you, you know? And so then he read my work and then he was like, oh, I really like your work. So he had always been a fan and um, he had always cared about these issues. They had mm -hmm. always been important to him long before it was personal. He always felt that people had a right to autonomy and agency and that you should be free to shape your life and your death as long as you were not doing any harm to anybody else. Um, you know, he had been a volunteer at Planned Parenthood since he was an undergraduate at Yale. So that was, you know, 40, 45 years of supporting Planned Parenthood. And so I think he wanted me to write about it because he thought I would do a good job and because he thought it was important for people to think and talk about these issues. And I was lucky enough to have the same alma mater. And I remember his name was Legend when I went there. Can you give us a sense of just what was the Brian Legend, particularly when it came to, to Yale sports and, and, his, uh, and his ancestry? Well, yeah. I mean, he was, as he said, you know, sort of football royalty, which I certainly perceive that, although it was very funny because, you know, he would talk about sort of his father who had won a Heisman and, and uh, you know, what a figure he was if you were a football fan, not that I am. Um, but in Connecticut, where we lived, I was very used to, you know, some older guy in the grocery store seeing Brian, you know, give out his stop and shop card and going, oh, Amici. Oh, Brian Amici. I saw you play in the bowl. Wow. Um, and he was, he was a wonderful uh, football player. who's a defensive lineman. Um, and he was as a person very much as he was as a football player, which is that he loved contact and it didn't matter if it was combative or affectionate. He just <laughs> liked contact. And tell us a little bit more, just I know it's so hard to encapsulate uh, an entire life and a, and a person you were so close to, but just to give some sense of his colors, um, it, it came, it, he was obviously someone who loved to travel he loved to be with you. And, and what I, I really so appreciated were the small things, you know, the watching a movie together, the going to your favorite, you know, clam bake restaurant. Uh, he was he was in a way not so sentimental, but it feels like your relationship was extremely romantic. It comes through um, a kind of romance without treacle, which is a hard thing <laughs> to capture on the page. But can you give us a bit of a sense of, of him and your and your kind of your romance together? Well, I, I think people who knew Brian would say that he was a big dog. I mean, that was really his style. Big laugh, big presence. Um, and, um, you know, could also be very um, tender and certainly romantic. Um, 
And I think both of us were just happy to have the opportunity to sort of have everyday life in front of us. And to me, you know, the romantic piece was really how much he was willing to change to be a better partner. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I always say is you should marry people for their faults, not for their virtues, because the faults are not going away. And Mm -hmm. You should prefer them. And I, I did. I, Brian was fearless and a little reckless. And one of the things I liked the most about him was that he was just game. You know, if I said to Brian, oh, honey, there is the drag queen mermaid parade in Coney Island in four hours, he would say, let me grab my hat. That's fantastic. And a wonderful quality. <laughs> So when things started to turn, and and I know this was not instantaneous at all, but these, I think any one of us who either fear fears any kind of dementia or has lived with it, has with someone we love, you, you see that this is not necessarily a neon sign. That there are kind of little, there's a little chipping away. Can you just describe what you began to notice? Yes, I think it would be so much easier if it were a neon sign as opposed to sort of a flickering candle in the corner that you can choose to ignore Mm -hmm. or pay attention to or go back and forth between ignoring and paying attention to, which I think is the way it often is for people. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the most striking thing for me was at his new job as an architect. Uh, The design work seemed to be going well, but he seemed to be getting a lot of complaints from his boss about the pace of the work. And then he himself began to complain about things in the office, like the printer. You know, he'd been an architect for 40 years. Um, He knew and he knew how to work a printer. I mean, he wasn't, you know, technologically skilled, but he did know how to work an office printer. And he found himself weakly asking for instruction in the printer and Mm -hmm. not always getting, you know, the kindest or most patient response from the office administrator, which I can understand. Um, And all of that really troubled him. He began describing his days and I kept thinking, you seem to be spending a lot of time in the dining hall, chatting Mm -hmm. with the dining hall manager and not a lot of time at the office. And I could see that he just wasn't making connections the way he usually did. He was a very likable guy and he didn't really, wasn't really connecting there. The work got slower and slower. And when his boss came in and finally said to him, we're not going to renew you next year. She was very nice about it. And she didn't say you're fired. She just said, we're not going to renew you. And it really hurt his feelings. But I think also he himself recognized that something wasn't going the way it usually did. And he didn't fault himself, which was also part of his style, but, um, but it, it struck me as odd. And I remember uh, you talked about how you were working on a television show at that point, because you've also uh, written and created, and, and that he what, didn't actually read a script draft, and that was really out of character. It was out of character. I mean, he loved reading my work and he always, I mean, he really did. I mean, he was, he was a much bigger uh, fan of my having a television career than I was. And um, he just left it on the floor repeatedly. And again, it was just not like him. It was, Mm -hmm. was on the floor, sort of in a dusty corner. And when I said to him, finally, after several weeks, you know, honey, did you, did you have a chance to look at the script? This is, of course, he's already retired, so that was not that he was super busy. He said, it's too hard to follow in this format, which sounds, as it often does with Alzheimer's, like a very reasonable reasonable response, except that it made no sense. And I think that is also very typical for Alzheimer's, especially for people with high IQs and good social skills. It's, uh, It's a sandcastle. You know, it has the form, but there's no underpinning. So the diagnosis, once you get it, you describe not being surprised by it, but it's still shocking. Was there an instantaneous discussion about the steps he might want to take because of it? Was that, was that not necessarily the same day, but within days? Well, within days, for sure. We took the weekend off. We just 
cried and ate out and watched television and uh, avoided all other people. And then after a few days, um, Brian said, I've, I've, I've thought about this and I know what I want to do. And I am not here for the long goodbye. That's not going to work for me. You and I have both seen that close up. That's not what I choose. And we need to find a way for me to end my life when I think it is appropriate to end my life. And mm -hmm. you love me and you're going to help me. And he was right. You say that uh, he would repeat, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. What do you think that meant to him in terms of what he feared? Well, I think he feared what we had already perceived in, in our family, which is, you know, the, the body ends long after the mind. And, you know, for some people, they retain a lot of qualities of themselves up to a point, but nobody with Alzheimer's retains that quality of being themselves until the very end. I and mean, that's simply not, it's not in any way possible. Um, and as he said, I don't want everybody to be relieved when I die. Mm -hmm. He said, I would like people to, you know, to feel that I had been present. I would like to be missed. I would like to be myself in this world. And when he said this was what he was sure of, did you try to argue him out of it? Well, it seemed to me such a big thing that I didn't see it as an argument. I said to him, um, you don't have to do that. I will take care of you. I will protect you. We will be together as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you know that I will make it that way. And he said, you're not hearing me. He said, that is not what I choose. It struck me, first of all, you became, in addition to the extraordinary writer you are, an extraordinary reporter, because it seemed like the research required, <laughs> if you want to die on your own terms, is, is overwhelming. It's, it's all these folks, even when I said that I was going to be interviewing today and they haven't read the book yet. And I've obviously recommended to everyone walking near me these days. It's so powerful. But they say, well, why didn't you just go to Oregon? Why didn't they just go to Hawaii? So can you give us just a sense of what people don't know about the architecture, to use Brian's uh, profession, of a, I guess, a, uh, a death with autonomy? Yes. Well, I, I, I do feel when people say to me, how about Hawaii? How about a Vermont? I, I always feel like the bad news bear. I'm like, well, if you have a terminal illness with six months left to live and two doctors who will attest that you have only six months left to live and you become a resident of the, of the right to die state, which you have to do. And then when you get to that state, you make application to a team of doctors whom you don't know, um, twice in oral interviews, usually once in a written interview. And then if they approve and declare you to be free of clinical depression, psychosis, and so on, and they have seen that the affidavit about you're only having six months to live, uh, there's usually a two week waiting process, although a couple of states have now waived that. Um, and then you can uh, get yourself to the pharmacy. And um, if, you, if you've been accepted, have a physician assisted end of life in which uh, as long as you are able to swallow, which by the way, is not the case for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you're able to swallow, you can use a straw. Somebody can hold your, uh, the glass of medicine for you, the lethal dose. Um, I think it's worth noting a couple of things. One is that the laws are almost identical in every state, which suggests that this was not random, uh, this design to make it passing through the eye of a needle. And I believe that there is no state in which more than a hundred people have availed themselves of this possibility in all the years that they have had those laws. Wow. So it was very successful in its goal, which was not to relieve suffering, but to make sure that as few people as possible 
pass through the eye of that needle. Very successful on those terms. And it struck me also that you talked about how any, um, any agency on another person's part, any assistance has legal peril, which is not yes, something. But not, but not for the physicians. So a okay. physician could hold your glass, a physician could help you steady the straw. But I believe that another person, for example, in your family could not do that. Mm. Each, each state has a tiny little bit of a tweak in some of the details. Um, but the overall thing is that, first of all, if you have dementia of any kind, if you have a dementing disease, you are not a suitable candidate for this in any state in the United States. And you were actually researching uh, methods of suicide that might be as painless as possible. What, what was that even? I'm sure that was surreal. But what was that? That was just like? surreal. Um, you know, as anybody who has spent a lot of time, uh, you know, at sick beds and at deathbeds, there, there is just a certain amount of unreality that you mm -hmm. begin to absorb and get used to. You are whatever it is, whether it is here I am in my pajamas driving to the pharmacy at two o'clock in the morning, or here I am informing my husband that a lady that we knew told us about a lady that she knew who put rocks mm -hmm. in her pockets like Virginia Woolf when she got her um, ovarian cancer um, a diagnosis that was very far along and walked into the Connecticut River, which ran through her backyard. And so I share that anecdote with Brian and he goes, oh, cold. I'm like, all righty. And what about the, uh, the dangers of even looking on the internet? I thought that was something I hadn't thought of before that that essentially you thought five steps ahead to when someone sees your computer or that even in cyberspace, you're leaving fingerprints or footprints. That was just me, I think, being cautious and also my young friends who know much more about the internet and computers than I do were like, don't use your computer. I assume that that referred to like their previous drug deals or something, but it was good advice for me. But too. what's the alternative to that these days if you want to I actually understand this landscape? You go to the library, you do your research on the library computer. Mm. That kind of thing. So you find D Dignitas. Um, can you tell us about Dignitas? For, I think many people don't know of it, although your book is a wonderful primer. Um, what is it, where is it, and what do they require? So it's a nonprofit organization in uh, Zurich in Switzerland. There are now actually two organizations like it. There is Dignitas, there is also Pegasus, um, which is very similar. Um, and in fact, was started by people who had worked at Dignitas. So now there are two nonprofit organizations which will help you with an assisted end of life, um, peaceful, painless, and legal in Switzerland, not cheap, $10,000, um, if you meet their criteria. And they want an, they want a biographical essay. There will be a couple of telephone interviews. You have to send them medical records. And um, you have to make it very clear that you have the discernment and the cognitive judgment to make this application. And it That's really struck, struck me that you could not be depressed, that you had to get a letter that essentially say this is not being driven by a depressive state. Right. I mean, you could be depressed in the sense that you've just gotten an Alzheimer's diagnosis, so you, it all seems pretty terrible, but you cannot have suffered from a lifetime of clinical depression. And their motto is death with dignity, sorry, life with dignity, death with dignity. Am I yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and they call it accompanied suicide. How is that language different, do you think? Why is that important? Well, it's interesting to me. I'm not sure if it is a, a language issue or an idea issue, but um, they do provide assistance. On the other hand, you are responsible for taking the medication yourself. You must be able to drink it or hold it or however it is that, that you're going to ingest it. That is still on the person making the application, not on the organization. So I think that's what they mean by accompanied, meaning we will help you arrange it, we will be with you, we will support you before, after, and during, but we will not inject you. 
And you also point out that you can change your mind at any time up until that last drink that they Absolutely. even say, that you even say it sounded it struck me that the dignitas doctor said he preferred that brian change yes. his mind yes um and i think that that's very helpful to people i mean they make it clear that this is not an obligation you have to them it is only about the obligation you have to yourself you also said according to dignitas 70 percent of those who get the proverbial green light never contact Dignitas again. Is right. that part of what you mean of just knowing it's there? I think for a lot of people that is very helpful and very supportive and many people, their lives take a different turn, their deaths take a different turn. Um, for us, we knew that we were going to be following through and you know, part of the difficulty with a dementing disease is you don't know how long a window you have in which you mm. are really cognitively high functioning and nobody can tell you. People can say often mm -hmm. it runs this way, often it runs that way, but actually no one can tell you when the window is going to close. And as yes. Brian said one time, you know, you end up, uh, you got to go before you want to go. Otherwise you won't be able to go at all. You said he knew he had to beat the clock and in some way his football training kicked in. Um, there was a sense of urgency reading your book, uh, almost frankly suspense as to are they going to get this, the letter that testifies to his kind, kind of, um, I guess, autonomy um, in time. And can you just talk about sort of when that looked like the window might be closing without it? Like you had a, a psychologist who I, I love the way you described this. You came home and Brian said, she's not on our team, realizing she's not gonna write that letter that you ultimately need as the final uh, green light. Well, he had been in therapy for a long time. He was a big therapy fan. And, um, you know, but the therapy was things like, what's it like to have a really famous father? Um, what's it like to be ending your career in architecture? What's it like to be in a new marriage? Those kinds of issues, they were not for, not for anything like clinical depression. And I think one of the things that we both experience is that doctors are people, as it turns out. And um, a lot of times it doesn't matter if you're asleep and they're operating on you, maybe it doesn't matter what kind of people they are, but I think it does matter what kind mm -hmm. of people they are. And what we experience were doctors who understood and were supportive and it was possible that they were not even going to be able to do anything useful for us and doctors who themselves found talking about the end of life and making a decision on how to handle the end of life to be frightening and upsetting and therefore mm. did not wish to have those conversations and um, I think in the end it does matter what kind of person your doctor is. So you finally do cross that threshold and you're going to go. Um, and I, I love the description of you consulting a, a tarot card reader who said, when you get offered a date from Dignitas, take it. Um, can you just talk about that scene and, and why her words actually were very prescient? Well, they were. And um, I realized that... Um, tarot card fan is probably not what people see at the top of my personality or at the top of my resume. Nevertheless, um, what she said is they're going to, I said to her, they're going to offer us a couple of different dates. Um, and she said, you need to take the first one. And I said, we might be not ready. We might have that. She, and she just said, you need to take the first one. She said, I am not saying mm -hmm that if you take a later one, it will be impossible. I am saying there will be great difficulty. And literally, as I was flying home from Zurich, they were starting to close airports in China and Europe. For the pandemic? For the pandemic. Unbelievable. So packing, packing your bags for Zurich, preparing for this, um, I just want to touch on your family, which comes through so beautifully, how close you all are. Um, there, there are so many characters, uh, too many to kind of honor here. But um, you have children from your first, from earlier marriage and grandchildren and obviously incredible sibling, uh, siblings, right? Um, but 
how much were you bringing them into what the plan was? And, and Brian's mother, obviously. Right. Well, it was a pretty small circle at first. Um, Brian's mother was just as just a rock star. She was great. This is a devout Catholic lady who said when we shared his plan with her, she said, I prayed about it all night. And I realized that what I was praying for was this. Mm. Uh, she had seen her best friend go through Alzheimer's. And um, she said, I did not want this for my boy. Mm. Um, so thank you. And, and, but, and before you go into the others, I'm struck and just because we're going to be on Jewish broadcasting service. There's so much of sort of the, the Jewish ways, the, the shrying, as you said, compared to Brian's family, which, which is, has just a different temperature. Yeah. How is that also playing out um, in how people were responding to this decision? Well, for my family, which is my, my sister, my, my parents have passed, um, my kids who are grown people, um, everybody was very supportive. Everyone was very sad and everybody was very supportive. And um, I don't think there was much spiritual conflict of any kind with it, within my side of the family. Brian's side of the family, um, for some people was more difficult than others or more complicated. Everybody did their best to be very supportive. And um, I really appreciated that, but we kept it fairly small. I mean, he would occasionally, I think I write about it, he gets an email from an old high school buddy who begins by saying, you, you don't have to end your life. I Googled Alzheimer's. You might have a lot of good years ahead of you. And I'm like, thank you for Googling. Um, <laughs> Little did they know. It was very funny also because yeah. um, when Brian was sort of angry, his like whole energy would sort of refocus. Whereas, you know, because of the Alzheimer's, there was just a little diminution of sort of energy and focus in general. But when he was pissed off, it all came together and he was like 100% himself. And he wrote a very kind email back going, we are available for encouragement and support. Thanks for writing. So the trip itself, um, it was, you're still sightseeing, you're still having meals before the final days. I mean, not obviously with a bounce in your step, but just, again, I keep using the word surreal, but what was it like packing a bag that you knew you wouldn't have to take home? Oh, everything about it was awful. I mean, that's the truth. There, there is not a moment in the packing, in the being in Zurich, in the going to the tea shop, in the walking down to the lake that was not simultaneously okay and absolutely awful. Mm. And all of it was like that all the time. Okay and awful. Yeah. And I'm not going to force you to go through the final scene, and I think people should read it. Um, it's it's beautiful, not only in its specificity, but it's in, a, it, in its economy. And it struck me that the economy of the rendering of it, it was, was maybe matched or mirrors the facts themselves, that once you're actually taking those steps, there's no orchestra playing and there aren't 15 people in the room. Can you just give us a sense of just once you're at that, at that sort of finish line? Um, I know that's a facile term. No, I mean, I suppose everybody is different. Um, I had, unfortunately, sat by people's deathbeds before in my life. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to arrange for both of my parents to die at home, which is what they wanted. Um, so on one hand, I wasn't new. On the other hand, it is always new. It is always overwhelming. Um, and I was very grateful, as terrible as it was, to be able to sit with Brian, hold his hand, touch his face, tell him how much I loved him, and know that he was not going to be in pain. Mm -hmm. And he was not. He was not in pain. He also wasn't afraid. So my final question, Amy, is I, I'm going to quote you back to yourself in this book. I worry, you write sometimes, that a better wife, certainly a different wife, 
would have said no, would have insisted on keeping her husband in this world until his body gave out. Is that something that you toss over in your head anymore? I don't. Um, I really think I had stopped tossing it over even before he died. Um, and in some ways, it's, it's also a function of the way that I write. It's like, what I really mean is a different wife, but possibly a better wife, but I was a pretty good wife. Um, I think that, I, I mean, I see how it is. I, I have friends who, mm -hmm. there's a close friend of Brian's who also played football with him, who also has Alzheimer's and he is at home still. And um, I'll tell you a story. The, the, the kindest thing that somebody did for me was another friend of Brian's who also played football with him. His widow came to see me. Um, he died about a year after Brian and she, we were not close. I mean, we liked each other, but it was really a relationship between the guys. And she said to me, I know that I made a different choice. And she said, we didn't have a choice. She said, by the time he got diagnosed, he was too far along to use something mm -hmm. like Dignitas, even if we had known about it. She said, but I want, I am here to tell you that was a wonderful gift you made to him and a wonderful gift he made to you. And I really appreciated that because I know that Everybody will make different choices for a variety of reasons. Some, some not experiencing it as much of a choice and other people choosing that path. Um, but I feel that there are, there are definitely more than one way to, um, to show love and to support your partner. Amy Bloom, it's an extraordinary book. Um, I say that without hyperbole. I recommend it to everyone and not just who's dealing with this, but um, on any hard decision, you show what partnership, true partnership is like and, and how it kind of can lead you to as much beauty in the end as is possible. Thank you for being with us. And the book is in love for anyone who hasn't yet bought it, for anyone they love. Um, I'm Abby Pogrebin for In the Spotlight. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.